All right, welcome back to the show, and thank you guys for joining us. And I'm excited uh, to be joined by our guest today. I teased this on last week's show, and um, got a fascinating guest here. A bit of a bit of a finance renaissance man. Uh, done a little bit of everything, and also the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, uh, "Colossal uh, Colossal Failure: A Common Sense." Um, about the failure of Lehman and told in first person, which is so much different than all these other memoirs that we've read about uh, the collapse. And, and of course, I'm speaking about uh, the great Lawrence McDonald. Larry, thank you. Do you prefer to be referred to as Larry or Lawrence? Is it, is it Larry? Yeah, Larry's fine. Thank you, Zach. Oh, okay, good. I didn't didn't want to be talking out of school there. But anyway, Larry, thank you so much for joining us, and I've really been looking forward to this. First of all, loved your book. We're in 12 different languages. Do I have that right now? We are in 12 different languages. Um, you know, I, I tell my, as a former Lehman trader, I tell my wife once a month, if we sell a million books, we'll break even on our Lehman stock. <laughs> Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, that well, and when you sold when you, the numbers at what six hundred six hundred and fifty thousand now copies of the book that have sold. Yeah, we're about six fifty now. Yeah, I mean that's no small dig. So so it tells you you know it tells you what a hole was left on your personal balance sheet from Lehman. Um, and I, before we get into that, because I am like I said, I just I I found I can't recommend the book enough. I thought you did a great, just a really interesting uh, job of you know, explaining it, but also your life story and how you integrated that into everything. I just, fascinating read. I couldn't recommend it enough. But I also want to start off with something that I identified with you uh, right out of the gate, was your start. You were not a blue blood uh, son of a hedge fund trader. Your dad was a very accomplished guy, but you weren't ushered into the, uh, you know, the, the, the best schools with the Ivy on the on the, you know, on the fences out front and a, and a straight shot into the Ivy League. Uh, you went through, I think you, in your words, you said you didn't go through the back door. You actually went through the back window. Um, g- give me a little bit. Say, start us off. You know, you were trying to break into the industry, get into the securities business, and you were, no, nobody wanted to hire you. And you started off selling meat. Do I, do I have that correct? <laughs> Well, as Doyle Bronson, the famous poker player, always said, he said, when luck shuts the door, you have to come in through the window. And <laughs> absolutely, um, I, my, my mom and dad got divorced when I was about 10. And uh, for about eight years, I was in eight different schools. We went from uh, the apple orchards of Bolton, Massachusetts, you know, beautiful uh, – you know, 10,000 square foot home to, uh, you know, housing project pretty quick. And, um, and my brothers and I and my sister, big family, we, we had a, a number of tough years in Worcester, which is a really tough, tough city. And, uh, but at the end, uh, you know, I think it, it made, made me a better person and it made me respect uh, the value of a dollar and, uh, and, and uh, got me grounded. And, but when I eventually uh, came out of school, uh, we had uh, the Gulf War was uh, upon us, and uh, we also had the SNL crisis. So those those things were pretty fascinating. You, know, you have to remember there were hundreds and hundreds of savings and loans that went um, out of business uh, in the in the United States in the late nineties or, or I'm sorry, early nineties, and. Um, so I, I I tried to get a job. I I, I think I had a um, hundred rejection letters from all the different Wall Street banks, firms, and uh, multiple times at each one. <laughs> and finally, um, I, I made my way down to you know I, I I struck out in Boston, struck out in New York, and um, went down and tried Philadelphia. And um, I snuck into the building of this Merrill Lynch office, and I snuck in. I dressed up as a pizza delivery man. <laughs> and uh, I had my suit underneath, and I went into the bathroom. I was taking off the, uh, the white overcoat, and uh, I was caught by a couple of uh, the producers, and they brought me into the office. And they sat me down on the chair, and they said, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> and I just told them, and they said, listen, I'm, I want to work with you guys, and uh, I've got a burning desire to uh, get into this business and achieve big things. And they said, well, 
you know, on the retail side of the business, Larry, uh, the key to that is really sales and and uh, perseverance. So you have to go out and sell something. And then one of the guys on the desk just said, uh, yeah, go out and sell pork chops. So it, it was kind of a dare. And I went out and for, you know, three or four months, sold pork chops, came back, and they gave me a job. And, and, and then you became – a uh, it, it, these are my words, of course, but a pork chop salesman extraordinaire. I mean, we're, we you, you were number one in the area. You 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 went after that with the same abandon. You went after everything else, and uh, and you achieved you achieved a, a a really a pretty astounding level of success doing that, didn't you? Yeah, it was um, it was it was just you know New England back then was a it's an interesting place to, to to develop a business and. Um, I used a lot of those contacts to develop uh, the retail business. So went from you know, all the way from Philadelphia through New England back up Philadelphia all the way up to New, New England back. So it was an interesting time. And so then, so then you finally you, you parlayed that into getting into and I, and I don't want to say it for you, but and 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 for those of you that haven't read the book, we're we're doing a very high level overview here. So I the 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 actual stories themselves are. You know, I, I feel like I'm not even doing it justice. So I would encourage you, you know, to to absolutely go read the book. But so then you finally break in one of these one of these uh, sleuth pizza delivery deals works out for you. You finally get you finally turn some heads. You break in. You start sell, selling convert bonds to the to the rich guys at the country club, uh, and you started hitting your stride. And this was all about. Correct me if I'm wrong. All around age 25, 26. Correct? Yeah, 25, 26, and I started to to develop an attraction to the convertible bond uh, market because that what I was fascinating about convertible bonds is a convertible bond is part equity, right? So it's right. part stock and it's part fixed income. So I figured, okay, I can learn two crafts at the same time. And it's also as an equity option component. So you can learn a little bit about uh, pricing volatility. So I found that pretty fascinating. And um, in the mid nineties, my, a good friend and I, Steve Seafeld, uh, started a website called ConvertBond.com. So I left the retail side of the business. I thought I thought the retail brokerage business would be consumed, and uh, really, I thought it was in a tough spot up against the Schwabs and the, you know the on potential potential of online trading coming down the pike uh, with the internet upon us. So we were we decided to create a website that uh, focused on convertible bonds. And I look back and, um, you know, we probably should have just created a dating website, you know? <laughs> but we, we, we had a good time with uh, convertbond.com and we ended up selling it to Morgan Stanley in October of 99, uh, you know, three months before the top. So that was a, that was a very, very fortunate sale. Boy, I, I would say so. The, the other thing, and I, this is kind of taking a side path here. The other thing I found interesting about these stories was now now this might be a loose connection to some, but I was fascinated uh, at how you guys spotted uh, the, the, the capability or the potential of, of the internet and integrating it into the business. Uh, Like you said, you saw the trouble that that was going to or the shakeup, if you will, that that was going to create in the uh, industry. And then when I read the story about how you guys put convert bond together, um, it just, Reading the story from you, it just seems so obvious. And yet, like so many other things, I don't want to give it away, but we would see this play out again during the Lehman crisis. Like so many other things, these changes or these turning points in in economies and markets, they seem to not get noticed by the insiders, that it's those people like yourself that didn't follow the traditional path that tend to see these turning points, like the effect the internet would have in the securities business, like the, you know, all the issues you saw going on in the real estate business. Why is it, Larry, from your perspective, from a, a guy that I, I think that your background is so unique, there's just not many guys that have hustled on the retail brokerage side of things and then been the head traders of, of trading desks inside Wall Street. Why is it that the outsiders seem to be the ones that pick up on these massive titanic turning points in economies. And while the people inside of it that came up the traditional route t- 
tend to be, I don't know if it's oblivious or I don't know if it's uncaring or, or reckless. Maybe it's a combination of all that. How do you describe that? Like I said, you, you got these two turning points where you guys saw the economic opportunity. Then you also spotted the real estate part of it, both of which the market, interestingly enough, right? The, the, the powers that be and the big players in the market, they miss both of them. Why, why is, why are the outsiders typically the ones that spot these things? Well, the biggest <clears throat> the biggest reason of all is they're not bought into, you know, the buy-in when you're vertically integrated. Like Lehman was vertically integrated into mortgages. So what that means is, when a company is vertically integrated, they not only originate the mortgage mortgages and sell them and move them on, but they own the mortgage company that originates them. And so they 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 have multiple risks. And um, when you have when you originate the mortgage and you own the mortgage company and then you have a Wall Street bank that sells the mortgages to other people around the world, it's very easy to get um, so bought in that you ignore the risks. You know, that's because the business became you know, such a big part of, of the profits. And uh, you know, I always say, to, you know, I always look back to what Steve Jobs, you know, maybe 15 years ago, was at a conference in the West Coast in the Valley. And and he was quoting um, Einstein, and he said um, to the audience, he said, you know, talent hits a target no one else can hit. Genius hits a target no one else can see. And it's it's not really about genius. It's more about um, really working hard at looking for that risk. And whereas if you if you really work at it day in, day out, and you're not overly bought in and with the blinders on, right? So the buy-in yep. creates blinders. Those that that combination allows you to find some genius. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the name of the show is Know Your Risk Radio. We're constantly preaching that message that look, the positive outcomes will take care of themselves. What you know, uh, you can't be doomsdayers and lock yourself up in a bunker, of course. But uh, you know, our job is is allocators of capital is really to focus on the risk and see the opportunity, but really you know, really identify that hidden risk. And I just thought that was fascinating that you, here we here in your story, we had this perfect setup of, of where that viewpoint allowed you to see opportunity and where it also allowed you to see risk. And it, both things, you know, sandwiched in together in a decade, just 10 years, uh, were greatly overlooked by the industry at large. And I, I just, I, I found that fascinating. So anyway, moving it along. Well, my, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, but my just just want to say my favorite quote ever, and it's such a moving quote for me. And um, it, it comes back to J.P. Morgan in 1907. J.P. Morgan 1907 states, "There's nothing in this world which will so violently distort a man's judgment more than the sight of his neighbor getting rich. <laughs> you know, the neighbor getting rich." And, um, you know, that says it all because it's, it's when you're in a cycle that is booming. Um, it's very easy for the plumber or the electrician, you know, sees the brother-in-law making a fortune in real estate, flipping homes. And all of a sudden you had people all around the country leaving, you know, 10, 20, 30 year careers to go jump into, you know, the real estate game. And, right. uh, that's, and that's literally the sight of the neighbor getting rich, distorting a man's judgment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fascinating stuff. I, and that's, you know, that was one of the ways we identified it. When you look around and you see everybody making money the same way and talking about how great it is, you kind of, that, that alone should cause, cause some pause, right? We should take a, take a step back at that moment and just say, wait a second, is it this easy? Because it probably shouldn't be. So Okay, so anyway, so moving on. And by the way, for those of you that have just joined us, we're with Larry McDonald, author of A Colossal Failure of Common Sense, number one New York Times bestseller and uh, uh, proprietor of the Bear Traps Report, who we are actually becoming a, um, uh, a client of. Uh, he put out some amazing research. And um, so for those of you, and they can find you at Lawrence, isn't it at Lawrence McDonald on Twitter? Is, did I get that right? Well, it, you know, it's at Convert Bond. Okay, at Convert Bond. Bond. Yeah, sorry. Bond. Yes. Yeah. yeah. At Convert. But you can find it with the name too. The name works. <laughs> okay, uh, and a great follow. Okay, so so we're, now we're moving forward. We've got we've got the start. Hey, you guys have got Convert Bond going. 
How did you, because I also really identified with your story of saying, hey, I'm going to do whatever I can to get here, but being a million dollar producer in the retail channel was not the ultimate aspiration. It was to play in the big show, it was be down on the trading floors at the big exchanges. So how do we make that jump from a young guy, 26 years old, who's killing it on the retail side of it, starts Convert Bond, and then how did you break in? Where was that moment where you broke into the big game? Well, my good friend from my hometown, I had a number of friends on Wall Street. So the first thing I did was I looked at, so I was at Morgan Stanley. I was running their convertible research effort or desk that, that called convertbond.com. So we were already on the institutional side. We were covering institutional accounts, but I wanted to work into trading. And uh, I looked around through my entire Rolodex of, of friends all around the world that were in finance. And um, I had one friend that was at Lehman uh, named Larry McCarthy. Uh, Larry McCarthy, Larry McDonald. Uh, no, it works. Just, uh, you know, two, <laughs> two Irish friends from the hometown. And um, I pitched him on, um, you know, coming over there and starting a convertible trading business, convertible bonds, where we would work with uh, their equity and fixed income divisions. And, and uh, I met, it did four or five interviews and got the job. Okay. 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 So now, and now you're, and now you're a trader. Now you've made it to the big game. You're trading at Lehman. And again, guys, we're just giving you the cliff notes. You gotta, you gotta read the book for yourself, but let's now let's jump forward to when we start seeing some things. What is the first thing? Um, as your as your career progressed, what what was the first thing? And I, I don't I don't I don't know even know if you recall that very first moment, but where you looked around and said, "Hey guys, we might have an issue here as far as the real estate mortgage subprime issue." Where was that first realization, and how did you come to that? Well, I never, I'll never forget. We're on the trading floor in 2007, and um, Larry used to have a, a famous line uh, about um, leverage companies. You know, think about a leverage company. They have uh, lots of debt and very little equity. And uh, Larry uh, kind of yelled across the desk, you know, that's big hat, no cattle. <laughs> and and, uh, and then I, we started looking at the Lehman balance sheet, and uh, Lehman was 44 times leveraged, 44 times. So that's like walking into a casino with $100 in your pocket, but you're playing at the table with 4400 you know, forty four hundred dollars, and um, good while you're winning. And and so we were looking at this. I'm like, because when I joined the firm, Lehman was only like twenty five times leveraged. Then three years later, we're like forty four times leveraged. And then one of the analysts that we had, Pete Hammock, uh, brilliant analyst, did the math, and he said he told us all. He said AIG and um, Fannie Mae are sixty times leveraged, Jeez. and. We, we had a discussion one day on the floor, like, what's really going on? And it was essentially, you know, the banks had these huge deposits, you know, Citigroup and, uh, and J.P. Morgan. So when an investment bank has to compete with a large institution, uh, leverage is important, number one, because you're competing against all those deposits. And then th the other thing that, that we started to realize is that the death of the partnership – was extremely important to the crisis where years ago, you know, through, through, through the last hundred years, a lot of these banks, insurance companies always had partners that owned all the equity. But when a company goes public and all the partners can sell their shares to the public, that's really the death of the partnership. So if Lehman had, or, you know, say any firm has a, a number of key partners that own all the equity, they're going to keep a much closer eye on the risk, whereas when the equity of a firm is diversified across thousands of investors, and then you bring in rating agencies and the like, it's very easy for uh, people to take their eyes off the risk. Yeah, well, and that's that's certainly certainly obviously with hindsight, that's exactly what was going on. And then you wrote about this too. I I found it fascinating because I feel like it's uh, you know guys like you and I talk about it. Um, I feel like it's largely an esoteric topic uh, to most of the people, most of the public. But 
I was fascinated by your work with Glass Steagall, um, and I'm Glass Steagall was kind of a, a hobby or or a, a just an interest of mine in general because I, I wrote a term paper at the end of my college career about uh, WorldCom for my uh, one of my final papers for uh, my finance degree, and I went into that whole research process, and and I promise this is gonna. I promise this is going to marry up. Um, <laughs> I went into the whole research process, digging into the WorldCom side uh, side of things, seeing where the fraud took place, and I kept ending inadvertently back to Glass Steagall. And this was, you know, this is 2002, so significantly before the real estate collapse. And the the term paper took a strange turn, where uh, it ended up being a focus on Glass Steagall and how I didn't think the WorldCom thing at least at the scale it grew to was possible outside of glass steagall uh and then and then watching that come it come to the fore again in the 0809 financial crisis um and then watching nothing happen to it on a legislative basis afterwards it wasn't corrected from your perspective how much did the dissolution of glass steagall play into all of this oh it had a ton it had a ton to do because when it wasn't just Bill Clinton, but it was Bill Clinton and the Republicans. Right, right. Um, they they dismantled Glass Steagall with the Graham Leach Bliley Act, and it it allowed the investment banks to compete you know, with the big banks. So you've got a, a a bank like Lehman that's really small, no deposits, and all of a sudden you're competing against a bank with two trillion in deposits. Hmm. Right, so. Yeah that just forces the investment bank to take lots of risks. And uh, there was really, it wasn't an even playing field. And um, that, if I'm, I'm very confident that if Glass-Steagall wasn't dismantled, that the financial crisis would not have been anywhere near as severe as it was. Well, and doesn't that, doesn't that play right in, and, and, and feel free to shut me down, but the way I've looked at it is, we were speaking earlier about the vertical vertical integration had had those things been separate um they would have been looked at with a much more jaundiced eye right they wouldn't have at least from my perspective um you would have had you know just just in the packaging of one of these mortgages one of these mortgage bonds you would have had two or three different risk offices assessing this as opposed to one right you wouldn't have had this this inbred nature to it is it, it and and then one of the things that I posited or I came to was just that alone kind of the 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 dissolution of those firewalls that were previously in place just due to the fact that you couldn't be in vertically integrated to that level don't you think that did, did that play into it as well I mean just kind of moving one hand you know moving money from one pocket to the other meaning that you know, this stuff didn't have to go through multiple compliance offices. It was just one. And these companies were allowed to, through Glass-Steagall, to become vertically integrated, in your words? Yeah, and it was the regulators, um, because because of the Glass-Steagall and because of the vertical integration, you went from one regulator that was looking at, say, the banks or the SNLs, so all of a sudden, there were five regulators that were responsible for Lehman. So what happens when you have five regulators? Um, responsibility goes out the window. So you had the New York Fed. You had the FDIC. You, right. Well, you had the SEC, FINRA. Uh, so you had so many different regulators. And um, when you have that many, it, it's very clear that nobody is really accountable and nobody really takes authority. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So we've got this situation where you guys start seeing, you start seeing this all hat, no cattle scenario playing out. And, uh, you, the other part that I found fascinating was the, uh, the visit that you guys made and the, and the conversations you had with the folks at new century was, was that, I mean, in the book that served as kind of a, a, a way marker, uh, was that the point where you guys said, okay, uh, this thing's going down. We need to play it from the short side. Um, uh, you know, th- th- this this is definitely the way that this thing's going to unfold. Was that the eureka moment, if you will, or or did it come earlier? Well, we we with our research team, we we look for what we call you know systemic risk indicators. Little in, indicate we had a, a basket of 
risk indicators that were starting to rise. And uh, the one thing that we started watching were early payment defaults. So let's just say early payment default is when someone misses their first mortgage payment. And we're not talking about a default on a mortgage. We're talking about buying a home and then counting around the country how many people are missing the first mortgage payment, the first one. And what we calculated in like 2006 in the whole country, uh, there were less than 20 of them. But by 2007, that number had gone up to close to 2,000. In each quarter, that number was going up exponentially. So it was it was about creating a basket of indicators that would give you kind of an early warning sign. That really helped us a lot. And that's what we're doing today. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, same process then. Um, and then... You guys, the the other thing that I, uh, there was a lot fascinating, but the other thing that I found interesting is you guys tried to take this to supervisors. You guys started taking that eye of what you saw, that basket of indicators, and you started looking at Lehman's scenario and going, wait a second, we, we, we're not observing this from the outside. We're actually a part of it. And you started trying to make the supervisors, the guys that, you know, the risk managers aware of that. So what, what was that process like? And was that insanely frustrating for you guys that, that those warnings weren't heeded? Well, yeah. So Madeline Antonzik, our risk manager, who we were, we were, we were educating Madeline Antonzik on a regular basis and just showing her some of our, uh, our data. And she was very helpful so she took some of our data into the meetings, and then she was actually thrown out of a meeting by our CEO. And so it's got to the point where what happens on Wall Street when the executives, when you, when the CEO has you know tons of control over a board, um, the risk management people just become, you know, you, it, it's just unbelievable. They they become almost like bureaucrats that are that are just not respected, and that that's what was happening with Lehman. Well, and you had a you had a somewhat of a tyrant at the top there with Dick Fold. And I, I, you know, just from your stories about it and then anecdotal stories from my time in the industry, it's, he, he wasn't the most open-minded fella uh, (laughs) when it came to uh, identifying these risks and, and taking heed. And I just, one of the interesting things that I'd never really thought about reading your book was Lehman really didn't get caught unaware. There were plenty of people inside the company that saw the issue. He just didn't want to listen to it. Like you said, it just everybody became, you know, I guess subjects of of Dick Fold and where he wanted to take things. And that was just sort of the end of the story was when did did you guys know that about him at that time? Because I I would and I just not to beat around the bush. I was surprised through going through the read at how much of this you laid at his feet and and the executives running the company, I, I was expecting to read more of a systemic failure type thing where it really was, uh, uh, from your perspective, you know, much more of a, of a focused screw up, if you will, or, or a blind spot. Um, w- w- was that, were, were there a lot, of, were you one and only in the firm? I mean, was there a very select few of you that had that impression or were many of you concerned about the blindness or the, I guess, the willful blindness uh, of, of Dick Fold and, and some of the upper management around him? Well, the words I always live by is, um, you know, there's no, there's no I in team ever. Right. And I was part of a wonderful group of people. So there was Mike Gelban. Mike Gelban now was the number two man at Millennium. He just founded a eight billion dollar hedge fund, um, Exodus Point. Mike was a very, very brilliant risk manager and clearly saw the warnings. And Mike, Mike helped us. We, as a group, you know, there's no I in team. But in 2007, we, we made close to two billion dollars on the short side, betting against some of these, uh, like you said, the new centuries and some of these companies in the mortgage space. And um, but for every dollar we were making. They were losing about eight upstairs. Wow. Wow. And that, that, that again, was another part of the story that really shocked me because I sat there and I went, it's just unbelievable that you've got a trade desk that so clearly identified the issue that they were making billions of dollars in profit on it while uh, they were literally profiting off the poison that was slowly killing the firm. Uh, slowly at first and quick picked up the pace. So, okay, now from the inside going 
uh, from the inside out, because again, our, my experience and everybody else is watching this unfold from the outside. When did, when was that moment in time where you guys at the Lehman trading desk went, oh no, it has started and this is headed in the wrong direction. I, I know you guys saw the seeds of it. We've already talked about, but where was that moment where you said, okay, the game is on. This this thing is happening now. When, when New Century in February 2007, uh, seven, yeah, February 2007, and New Century equity went from $32 to zero in like 30 days. Yep. And remember, New Century was a mortgage originator. Um, and so we had gone out about the month before that. We were short New Century. We'd gone out to the West Coast. And um, the, the big short movie uh, kind of stole our scene. But there's a scene in the book where we go out uh, to the West Coast and we went to this kind of lounge bar near New Century where their offices were. And we saw this uh, the Corvettes, the, the Lamborghini, the Porsches outside. And we go in there and we start talking to some of the salespeople on a Friday. It might have been a Thursday, Friday, you know, around four o'clock or five o'clock. Everybody's getting out of work. And, uh, yeah, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing from some of these people. They were selling these, you know, they weren't the, the brightest bulbs on, on the planet. They were making millions of dollars a year and they were selling, uh, you know, adjustable rate reset mortgages to people that, you know, kind of loans that would actually, they knew would blow up on their clients, you know? So these are really bad people. And uh, these products are massively unsustainable. And this was new centuries, you know, kind of sales force. And then we came back to New York and sure enough, a month later, we, we, we put on a bunch of shorts and put spreads on new century. And then a month later, the company imploded. And that was really the moment where we knew that this is, this is a real problem. The, one of the things that cracked me up is we, you guys were structuring those put options and those shorts, and you were sitting there saying, hey, if this thing drops to 20, we're going to make a pile. Little, little did you guys know that you weren't going to have to. 20 was not going to be the threshold of profit for that trade. That thing was going to zero in a hurry. Uh, I just I, I got a chuckle out of that because, you know, from the inside out, you're, again, we're risk managers. You're setting up a trade and you're sitting there going, OK, where is the point where this thing's going to be profitable? When you guys were putting that on, um, again, the structuring of the trade, I know you don't think like that. Did you think it was a zero? Or did you just think it was going to get hammered hard? What was the viewpoint of that? Were you guys thinking, okay, this thing is going to nothing, or is it just it's going to get hammered hard? Well, our analyst Christine Daly, who's like one of the best distress analysts, uh, you know, she was looking at the company wasn't quite distressed yet, but she was looking at the assets, she was looking at the balance sheet. She thought it was a zero, but you know, we all thought it would take a good year. What we didn't imagine is that it would take that short period of time. And what people have to understand, and, and for investors listening to us right now, the one thing to always remember is when you look at a stock or you know any stock, you have to look at the whole capital structure. So there's debt and equity. And with some companies, say like Apple, Apple's equity is 90% equity. I'm sorry, Apple's enterprise value. So the value of the whole company for Apple is 90% equity and like 10% debt. Right. But most people just look at the equity, right? And so this, there are companies out there like Tesla that are, you know, <laughs> that are, or, or Deutsche Bank or some of these leveraged banks where right. you have, you can have a company that's 50, 60, 70% debt and maybe 30, 40, 50% equity. And in the case of New Century, the, the public equity might have been $30 a share. But the, the company had tons and tons of debt and off-balance sheet leverage. So Christine just felt if there was a problem, the equity would get wiped out really fast because, let's just say in this case, the equity might be $30. Maybe that's $2 billion. But they, they had you know, close to $20 billion of, of debt and obligations. So net, net, net. You really, even though the stock's thirty dollars, you think you own a stock, but you just own a little tiny sliver of equity in a pie. And uh, when you have that type of just a sliver of equity in a pie, that's where the stock can go to zero really, really fast. Yeah, you've got that that upside down equity or that upside down capital structure, and and uh, yeah, and it, you know that's funny because I listened to that today. I 
again, I think you can be too far inside sometimes and, and, and you know, too, uh, I don't know, too, well, the old adage, you know, if you're standing four inches away from an elephant, try to describe it. You know, you got to step back to get some, to get some, you know, view and some scale. Um, but you don't hear people talk about enterprise valuation enough anymore, right? Taking that debt into consideration and looking at that capital structure. Um, and it kind of surprises me because I feel like we're here again, only another nine or 10 years later. Um, I, I hear that same mistake being made and I don't want to make this transition too quick. Cause I want to ask you a couple things. Do you see some similarities with where we're currently at in relation to what you experienced in 0809? Yes, but not from the banks, more from the corporations. So right. what's happening now is, you know, it, it, elections have a lot to do with business cycles. And what, what we're going to see the next couple of years is the White House is going to do whatever they possibly can to extend this business cycle. You know, they're getting help from the Fed. The Fed promised us three rate hikes this year in October. And then by, you know, early January, the market's starting to look at two rate cuts in terms of probability. So that's a reversal of five. You know what I mean? We're, we were going to go from three rate hikes to now, um, as of this, you know, say as of the first quarter, the market's looking for two cuts. So that's a huge, colossal move in central bank policy. And um, that plus some fiscal stimulus, uh, if, if the White House has a number of plans that I think they're in the works from whatever Fannie and Freddie uh, to expand the credit box there. So what happens is that you have a business cycle that's gone on for a long time. You have an election and they will do whatever they can to extend this cycle. And what will happen is the, the debt profile of on the corporate bond side is already right now really, really, really ugly in terms of leverage. And it's only going to get more leverage the next you know, six, nine months. And then, then we're going to have a big collapse sometime in the next you know, 12 to 18 months. But they, they're going to do whatever they can to keep it right after the election. Yeah. It, it, and one of the things that I want to talk to you, so you know what, let, let, I, I won't try to hold this back because this is really what I've been interested in. in, in well, I think the whole thing is interesting, but the point I wanted to get to was to ask you where we're at now. So how... And I know we're all stabbing in the dark here, but but the ability for central banks to keep juicing this thing and keep things uh, on the rails um, has really astounded me. I really thought that they would lose control at some point. How much longer do you think that they can extend this process? And what do you think will be the break point? You know, and again, I, I understand we're all speculating at this point, but where, where is that point where the transmission of all this central bank policy breaks down and the weight on the other side of the scale becomes too great for the Fed to keep propping things up? Well, it's going to be similar to remember, remember the early payment default with the mortgages, right? Yep. So they lent so much money to so many poor borrowers that they, in other words, the lending was so disgusting and so prevalent, the excessive lending, that they were lending to people that couldn't make the first mortgage payment, right? Right. So the same thing now is happening with countries, okay, so sovereign countries, you know, as well as corporations. So what we're going to start to see sometime in the next, you know, 12 months, most likely, is a point where corporations start missing their first coupon payment on a bond. So you'll have a multi-billion dollar issue bond. Everybody wants to buy it because the Fed's on hold and, uh, you know, the White House is doing whatever they can to juice the economy. And uh, you want to watch, instead of that early payment default on mortgages, you want to watch corporate bonds and sovereign bonds missing those early pay- early coupon payments. Yeah, so that's that's that ignition point that you guys are looking for. Um, yeah, and I, I echo that. I, I think of, well, I think of Tesla. You brought Tesla up, and we just had a, a bond repayment, and I, uh, I don't think that they're going to be able to raise capital through selling equity, so my guess is they're going to try to uh, access the bond markets again. Um, and I'm no credit expert, but you know that you think about Tesla, and I think about a scenario where you could easily see a company like that take out a big bond payment, or you know, uh, do a big uh, money raise, a debt raise, and uh, and miss that first interest payment. That'll be that'll be fascinating to keep an eye on. So so between but now between now and then, over the progression of this, 
What, what do you think the road to that is? And do you think there's any way, how, how do you think that they're going to try to combat that? Because the one thing that I've come to the realization of, uh, probably too late, only a couple years ago, was, look, they're not going to get religion all of a sudden and turn around and start acting like responsible actors. I just, I don't see that happening. They're just going to keep trying to kick this can down the road. So, so where is that path and what do you think, if any, I mean, is there a policy response to, to when this scenario starts playing out? I, w- w- what is the role? Well, the between- first thing we're going to see, the first thing is the, so this year we have $750 billion of corporate debt. So investment grade, loans, and high yield, $750 billion coming due. And over in Italy, for example, uh, Italy has $850 billion uh, coming due in the next three years. So we have a lot of really you know, poor quality companies, uh, a lot of near-term debt maturities in not just on the corporate side. Total corporate debt in the United States is three times what it was just over a decade ago. Wow. And uh, we have a major maturity wall coming at us. So it, it won't take much. I mean, the, 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 the central banks are going to have to be shift to being very accommodative to, to prevent a major default push. But once again, an accommodative means cutting rates. But the problem is it gets back to that whole early payment default thing. If the Fed goes really dovish one more time and starts to cut rates and allows for more easy borrowing – you're just going to get to a point where they've lent the money to the to the worst quality companies, and and um, it, at some point you just reach when we're very close, you just reach a point where um, defaults just happen because the cash flow of the company just can't support the debt profile. Yeah, well, and again, I don't mean to pick on Tesla. It, you maybe I may have heard this from you, but. Uh, Tesla and I looked into it and I verified it, but so if you didn't say it, I, I know that it's true. But I think Tesla is the first company that's ever passed something like a thirty-five billion dollar market cap and had debt trading in junk levels. Was that your quote? Did I pick that up from you? Yes, yes. It's they. they it was a fifty-five, fifty-two billion of equity market cap with a junk bond. I mean, it's just crazy. Like, think about it. If you just think, sit back and think, that doesn't make any sense because. Junk bonds, like in my entire career going over 35 years, a junk bond is issued to a company that doesn't have that much equity. Because if you have lots of equity, you shouldn't have to issue bonds at, say, close to 7 to 8%. Right. And um, when treasuries are, yield, tre- treasuries are yielding 25 and the Tesla bonds are 7 to 8%, it makes no sense. And it's just – it just tells you the credit markets, it's basically a war, right? It's an intellectual war. The credit markets are telling the equity, you guys are smoking in the dynamite shit. You're smoking in the dynamite shit. The credit markets are telling you that because you have a bond. Why is the Tesla high yield bond, why is that jump bond trading at close to 8% when you have a $50 billion market cap? Now, the equity people are telling you, you know, you guys are – out to lunch. You don't understand the growth potential of this company, and um, you know it's and all the technology that Tesla has, their market share in the United States. You just don't understand. This is a new economy. You know the upside is is so outstanding that people are willing to pay fifty two billion dollars for the equity, even though they have you know a huge pile of debt. Yeah, yeah. the The other thing that I think is interesting, and I don't know if you've picked up on this, so feel free to chime in, but. The other thing I find interesting that I don't remember in 2007, 2008, and I could be wrong, but I have a pretty clear memory of that time just because of my own experience. But I've seen a unprecedented surge of, especially on the retail side, of investor optimism just in the last four months. Um, An increasing amount of investors, even at our firm, worried about missing out on gains. Um, And, you know, to me, that is the siren song of, uh, boy, we're getting long in the tooth here. And I look at the excesses and everybody looks back at 08 and 09 as this big anomaly, right? It can't happen again. The words of Janet Yellen and her infinite wisdom. Um, but 
I, I look at it and I, like you said, the credit markets are far more excessive. The equities are priced so much more richly than they were in 2007, 2008. And then the investor appetite, at least from my perspective, especially on the retail side, is I haven't seen it. I, I In my career, 14 years doing this, I have not seen a level of retail investor bullishness just in the last four months. Have Have you seen that? And then does that also, again, it's anecdotal. It's not data. We can't point to it. But does that marry up with where we are in the economic cycle and your understanding of things? Well, one thing I want we can keep track careful of uh, carefully is like we look at capitulation moments. We have a model that measures capitulation. What I find fascinating is Warren Buffett in the fourth quarter. Okay, he only put like you know five or six billion to work, which is this very small, very small component of his cash. Yeah. So he has a record cash position, record, okay? It's the biggest cash pile that he's ever had. And then in the fourth quarter, when stocks really, really, really went on sale, we're talking 20% down in the S&P, but the average stock was down close to 30. And Warren Buffett didn't deploy that huge historic cash pile. That tells you something. It yeah. tells you a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And everybody's just whistling past the graveyard. You just got to keep buying up that equity and just keep doing it. Um, OK, so the other the other question I wanted to ask you um, is and, and for those of you just joining us, we're being we're joined by Larry McDonald here, author of A Colossal Failure of Common Sense, the inside story of Lehman. He was running the Lehman trade desk that amazingly made two billion dollars of profit in 2007 while the uh, while the company was bleeding out. Um, the other thing I want to ask is get you into this dollar bull dollar bear debate. Um, and I haven't heard your thoughts on this. Maybe I just haven't dug deep enough. Uh, but will, will we be looking at a scenario where we're going to see massive dollar strength because of the upcoming issues? Or do you think, uh, I guess I should say this. Do you think the biggest risk to the economy at this point, we, we've identified the corporate debt and things like that. Do you think we're looking at an era of inflation ahead of us as being the biggest uh, uh, danger, meaning a, a, a big loss in the value of the dollar? Or do you think we're looking at a very strong dollar being the being a hallmark of this next stage that we're that we're coming up on? Well, remember, so when I was growing up, the U.S. was 40 percent of global GDP, almost 50. So in like the 70s and 80s. Today, there's 62 trillion of GDP outside the United States, 62 trillion of economic activity GDP outside the United States, and there's 18 trillion inside. So the U.S. is a very small component of the global economy. And on top of that, since, since the last, say, 12 years, there's an extra, you know, there's an extra forty billion dollars of debt in the world. Maybe it's probably more like, I'm sorry, forty, fifty trillion, close to fifty trillion of debt. And out of that, there's fifteen trillion of dollar-denominated debt. So those things combine to a really big problem for the dollar because, as as, the, as we've seen in recent years, in 2015, 16, the Fed said they were going to hike rates twelve times. The dollar ripped higher, and all of a sudden, global default risk spiked, and the Fed had to stop. And that's because when the dollar moves higher, uh, because of all the economic activity outside the United States, and because of all that dollar-denominated debt, when the dollar moves higher, it really crushes the global economy. I call the dollar you know, the global wrecking ball. Right. And um, you know, remember, the dollar is, in terms of global trade in terms of currency, all that economic activity in the world, still like 65, 70% of all currency reserve transactions are in the dollar. So when the dollar is strong, it just crushes that 62 trillion of GDP. And guess what happens? We saw this in the fourth quarter last year, that global economy really snuffs out the, the, the growth inside the United States. And the Fed, the Fed promised us all last year, we're going to stay in our lanes, he said that 17 times, yep. Mr. Powell, the chairman. He said, we're going to stay in our lanes. In other words, we're going to hike rates. We don't care about the global economy. And the beast inside the market broke the Fed right over its knee. And, and, and that's because of the dollar. So 
net, 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 the dollar really has an invisible uh, cap. If it, if it were to really go much higher, once again, it crushes the global economy because of all the debt in dollars, because of all the econ- economic activity that's traded in dollars. And therefore, then it comes back to the U.S. So there's, okay, so the dollar, say, 96.7 right now, maybe it goes to 98, 99. But so you have really, you know, two, two handles of upside. Uh, but you're looking at like 15, 20 handles of downside over the next two, three years. Gotcha. Now, one of the... And, and I, I, would also, I would also, just most importantly, I forgot to mention, um, it's very clear we spend a lot of time taking our clients around the hill, around Washington. We'll take the hedge funds and the asset managers from around the world, from New York down around the hill. And it's just when you spend a lot of time in Washington, you really get a, get a strong feeling that Trump uh, is determined to find, that uh, the Trump administration is determined to find whatever they can to get to, to get a weaker dollar. And uh, Mr. Tr- Mr. Trump, President Trump just appointed two new Fed governors in the last week that are putting very dovish, uh, you know, dovish language in there, and they're kind of their 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 assessment of where we are now. So, yeah, the the, the Trump administration wants a weaker dollar, and um, heading toward the 2020 election, I think they're going to get it. Okay, now now what if? And, and I I know that you I appreciate the time you've spent with us, and we got to get you going. You're a busy guy, but one of the last things I want to ask you is if if as this thing starts to unfold uh, uh, and we reach the end of this cycle and we start seeing the problems in the corporate debt market that you're talking about, uh, what is to prevent the Fed from going full ECB mode and just starting to buy up corporates? And do you think that's a possibility? Oh, that's definitely the next Fed, but it, it won't happen right away. It'll take a crisis. But for sure, right now, the, the Fed's balance sheet got up to $4.5 trillion. They took it down to four trillion so far, so they've taken five hundred billion, five hundred billion off the balance sheet. But that's still, you know, very, very high, big balance sheet. And um, you know, they remember the Fed promised us last year the, the balance sheet was going to go down to two trillion or two and a half. <laughs> they, they said that like twenty-seven times. Yeah. And now they're they're now they're basically caving and they're they're stopping the balance sheet reduction right around 4 trillion maybe a little bit under you know 3.8 so the next crisis uh th- this you know these central bankers remember they they're so bought into their own policy and this whole MMT uh you know from the left you know these this all the, the we have a number of left wing candidates that are running for president far more than we've ever had in the history of the country all these people support a, a fed that is using the balance sheet to support uh, you know, public debt profile, public issuance, really irresponsible fiscal uh, spending, and using the Fed, you know, the magic potion, uh, to enable uh, really reckless, reckless spending. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a strange new world, and it's one that, um, that I, I, you struggle to get your, your head around things. And one of the things is just a little side comment here. I, I'm going to keep asking you stuff. Like I said, I know you got to go. But uh, a little add on to that. One of the things that keeps me rolling is, is or, or, or keeps my mind constantly going and trying to figure this out is there, there's so many out there that go, hey, the Fed can't do this. The Fed can't do that. We're at, <laughs> we're at this point of absurdity and, they, and surely they can't go that far. I tend to look at things a little bit differently. I, I look at them as being so far off the track, so far away from normalcy, that what is to prevent them from ratcheting up even further? What is to prevent them? Like you, you were saying, yeah, that's the next step. I, I see that next step as almost a certainty. Um, they're not going to, like I said, to, to start this, uh, this discussion, they're not going to get religion. I, I don't see them changing things, and I think that they've created too many abnormalities and too many imbalances to stop doing it. Um, what What is going to happen that will take the keys out of their hand? Will it be a falling dollar? Will that be the thing that finally you know, takes uh, the keys away from the drunk and makes them stop? Well, yeah, eventually, you know, that's – remember, the, pro, the, the problem with like that, like the, the, you have a good point there. Eventually, the, the market's going to overpower them. 
But the problem with that is um, the GDP in the United States is $18 trillion. The unfunded liabilities are anywhere from $110 trillion to $200 trillion, depending on who you're listening to. So there's tons and tons. And right now we're doing a trillion-dollar deficit a year. So there's, it's a mathematically unsustainable debt profile. But guess what? It's, if you look around the world at uh, Italy, uh, Japan, you, you, all you just have to do is look at the other – even Canada. Uh, Canada and, and their irresponsible, you know, reckless path that they're on – the problem is, if you're a billionaire and you have to put a billion dollars somewhere, where on earth are you going to put it? Right. You know what I mean? Like, let's just say you wanted to put it in Switzerland or wanted to put it in um, in Norway, right? You can't just put ten billion dollars, and there's not enough debt in these countries for you to buy, right? right. And there's not enough. Very difficult to put that much money in, in oil or you know fill gold. So, I mean, you, you can try to, you know, gold's pretty liquid. But at the end of the day, what's happening is these billion, so much wealth has been created that these billionaires around the world are forced to own treasuries because we're, I don't want to say that, you know, we're the tallest short man in the room. Yeah. Okay. So, so we got to wrap it up here. Like I said, I know you got to get going, but as a parting shot, what, what would be your advice from a guy that's been on all sides of it, the buy side, the sell side, running the trade desk, doing the whole thing, now running a research firm, global macro research firm. Uh, it's got a ton of institutional clients. What would, your be, what would be your piece of advice to the layman, the retail investor out there who's all bowled up, has watched this thing go to the moon for 10 years? Uh, you know, he's listening to the market cheerleaders, the Kramers of the world. What, what would be your advice to the retail investor about – where he should be now and what he should be doing over the next couple of years. Well, one of the things that we've been talking to our bear traps clients about around the world is looking around at the markets that are cheaper than the United States. What we do is we measure capitulation. We look for cheapness. We look for, you know, value around the world. And for retail investors, you know, you, you can buy, um, emerging markets, you know, some of them like Brazil, but you wouldn't want to concentrate you know, all your money in Brazil. Right. But a basket of emerging market uh, equities uh, that would give you uh, a very a much better risk reward. So EM, emerging market equities are trading at 13 times earnings, and the S&P is trading at 17 times. Yeah. So you know that's that's one you know, thing to look at. Uh, the other is, um, in terms of bonds, um, you know, you can always focus on, you know, the short end of the of the cur- curve or even CDs today. I mean, you've got a very high yield in, in, in T-bills. Yeah. So cash is paying a decent return, but finally. And, and, and then there are other sectors. Um, you know, the energy stocks have been decimated because of, a number of reasons. I mean, right now the percentage of it, and, and, and don't forget consumer staples as well. So the percentage of the S and P that's in consumer staples, and remember consumer staples and uh, the two groups that we're looking at: consumer staples and energy. Uh, staples used to be 12 percent of the S and P 500 in like say 2010, 11. Now they're, you know, they got down to like six, seven percent. Wow. So what we do is we measure sectors within the S&P, big sectors, and we look for, you can tell when they're out of favor when they are a very small percentage of the S&P. And for example, the financials in like 2006, seven were you know, upwards of close to 20% of the S&P was in financials. And by 2009, 10, they were down to five or 6%. And that was the best time to buy them, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you want to look at energy down here. I mean, it's, um, the percentage of the S and P that's in energy uh, ten years ago was upwards of twenty percent. Now, in the, in the last three four months, you've had because of you know the, the view on electric vehicles and things like that. Uh, you're you're looking at energy is a very low component, like six seven percent of the S and P. And then there are emerging technologies like electric vehicles. So if you have a basket of investments that have energy, you know traditional oil. And gas and oil, oil companies, natural gas uh, companies, and then own as well a basket of um, companies that have exposure to electric vehicles. Remember, China 
is selling last year a million electric vehicles, and that's up from 400,000 three years ago. So China has a billion people, and they only – think about this, a billion people, and they only sold – uh, one million electric vehicles. So you're talking about, you know, say, five, ten years from now, ten to twenty million electric vehicle sales a year in China. Wow! And so there are companies and, and uh, portfolios of companies that uh, be- will benefit from these, you know, large growth sectors in the world, and, and that, that's where to really start to, to, to look and put put the money. So it's fair to say your outlook is not to short vol and be long tech stocks. <laughs> no, no, no. The semiconductors are a screaming sell here. The fangs are just death. And the, you know, the fangs. You don't you don't want to own a fang stock? It's Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix. Um, you know, this just to remember this. The other thing we haven't discussed, and just in closing, that one thing that investors have to understand is that you know, passive investment strategies, which is just index funds. Yeah. You know, have taken in a trillion dollars in the last, you know, two, three, four years. And that money, when it goes into the index, it has to own the, you know, there's, so if a trillion dollars goes into an index fund over like two, three years, that's like, that's like $200 billion that has to go into the banks. It has to go in. There's no, like, there's no portfolio manager that's saying, oh, I want to buy this stock or that stock. It has to go in. It's $200 billion. So every month there's another, like, you know, five to 10 billion bucks that's going into these fangs, that is just, there's no choice. It has to go. And so you, that's why you have these valuations that are just so absurd. Yeah. Well, I, I can't appreciate you coming on enough. Fascinating conversation. And, and for those of you that want to follow Larry, and I, I would strongly advise it, you can get him at, at Convert Bond, C O N V E R T B O N D, on Twitter. Uh, you can go to the beartrapsreport.com. That's his website. Uh, phenomenal source of uh, research. Like I said, we are becoming a client. And uh, Larry, thank you so much for joining us. And um, hopefully it wasn't too painful and we'll be able to get you back on at some point when, when these things begin to unfold a little bit more. Oh, Zach, thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate the, the people out in the West Coast. And you guys are up in the uh, upper northwest and it's a really wonderful part of the country and uh, every time i'm up there i just notice you know being from new york and living in manhattan i really appreciate the, the people up in the uh, the great upper northwest well thank you and if you're ever in town i'll uh, i'll buy you dinner and a drink so so let me know okay all right larry thank you, thank you so much thank you for joining us we gotta run but thanks for listening to the show uh we'll be back next week as always you're listening to know your risk radio on am 770 ktth